they did, and the computers told them these people won't default if their FICO score is this, or if they have this demographic, or if they're a homeowner, they'll never default. Why should they default? They own a home. They're going to be rich, right? Homes are always going to appreciate. They had all these crazy things, but the credit card companies wanted more and more loans. The more loans on their books, the more debt they could securitize, the more interest they could charge, the more money they could make. So they issued too much credit. And Americans took advantage of that credit and bought all sorts of things that they never should have been able to borrow the money to buy because they obviously couldn't afford to pay it back. But these geniuses, these Nobel Prize winners, pocket on Wall Street, you know, had their faces stuck in a computer screen and they couldn't look up to see reality. And it didn't matter that these computer algorithms that they came up with, you know, said, aha, this is going to work. All they had to do is look at how much people were borrowing to realize that it couldn't possibly work. I mean, that's probably why I was able to understand a lot of this and predict a lot of these defaults and collapses, because I didn't have any of these programs. I was just using common sense. I just knew that people couldn't afford all this stuff on what they were earning. You could see income stagnating and debt increasing, yet people were buying everything in sight and putting it on credit. And you knew there was all these gimmicks, you know, buy now, pay later, no payments, no interest for 12 months, 24 months, zero down, zero financing. I mean, obviously, this was going to be a disaster. The only people who didn't know it were the people that were too busy following these computer programs to take a look at what was happening in reality. So this, 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 the point of this Meredith Whitney article is, yes, she's right. There is a looming credit card crisis. Duh. But, you know, we don't want to stop it. The crisis is not... The lines being shut and the credit being taken away, that's the solution. The problem was all the credit being extended in the first place and all the excess consumption and the lack of savings that easily uh, available credit produced. Those problems. And as painful as the solutions are, we have to look at them. And, of course, there's a lot more problems coming up. I mean, it's not just residential mortgages. You know, you've got commercial uh, real estate going down. You've got a lot of development loans. You've got a lot of developers that borrowed money to build real estate projects, to build uh, condos, uh, to build single-family homes, to develop little shopping centers. A lot of these loans are going to go into default. And, and this is big. I mean, this is just starting. I mean, we have wave after wave after wave of these defaults as this whole phony economy comes unraveling. And there's no way that anybody can put it back together because the economy was based on assumptions that were made. All of these real estate developers who were building these little shopping centers, they were projecting certain increases in, in, in spending, up, 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 you know, in, 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 you know, in perpetuity. And there were all these assumptions that were made that made these deals appear viable based on how they were going to cash flow and based on what the interest rates are going to be on these types of loans. Well, all that has changed. The loans are now very expensive. I mean, lo loans are low for the government. If you're the U.S. government you want to borrow right now, it's really cheap. If you're anybody else, it's really expensive. Meanwhile, you can't get the revenues out of your leases anymore because Americans can't shop the way they were. You know, the old expression, you know, shop till you drop. Well, we did it, and now we can't do it anymore. And so a lot of these projects are just no, are not viable. It doesn't matter how you crunch the numbers. And so these developers are going to default, and these properties are going to come on the market, and the debts are going to go bad, and there's nothing they can do. You know, the problem is the government solutions, or they're in quotes, worked for a while only because their solution was merely to postpone the problem till another day. And, but every time they did that, they made the problem bigger, and the problems got bigger and bigger and bigger. The problem is now, the problem is so enormous that it's virtually impossible to postpone it anymore. We have now come to the point where we have to deal with the problem. The fact that we're choosing to ignore it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to push these problems far into the future. We're just going to deal with it differently. I've been using this Band-Aid analogy. I mean, the time has come that we've got to take the Band-Aid off. Right? We can rip it off and get it over with, but no. The government wants to peel it off slowly, a little bit at a time. And it's going to hurt even more for a longer period of time but that's it. We've got to take the bandit off right now. There's no way to try to postpone it like Greenspan did time and time again. So we're going to suffer. It's just unfortunate that the government is going to make this thing so much worse than it had to be. And, of course, it already had to be pretty bad as a result of all the things the government has already done. Anyway, let me quickly go to the phones. We've got a lot of people patiently waiting. Uh, Tony in Illinois. 
Hi, Peter. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I've been reading uh, about you pretty much every day, uh, watching you on the news. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with uh, your stance on inflation, uh, but with everything, and you mentioned it earlier on in your show about consumers being pretty nervous about spending, uh, investors don't want to invest, uh, everybody's sitting on the sidelines or they're just sitting on their money, uh, in turn, you know, isn't this slowing down the velocity of money? So even with this stimulus package, uh, this money isn't going to be changing hands quickly. So wouldn't that lead to a deflationary environment? Well, the velocity of, of money has slowed down, and a lot of the money that the government is creating is simply parked in treasuries or under people's mattresses or in the bank. And, yes, uh, a lot of the money the Fed is creating isn't being spent yet. It will be. And at some point, velocity is really going to pick up once people perceive that their money is losing value. Right now, there's no rush to spend the money because money seems to be gaining value because prices are falling faster than the value of the money. You know, the government is printing a lot of money and debasing the value, but prices have been falling for a number of reasons. You know, going out of business sales, deleveraging, liquidation sales, you know, whatever's going on. And so money has been becoming more valuable. That is going to come to a halt, and it's going to come to a halt soon. And prices are going to start to rise. And when that happens people are going to want to get rid of their dollars before they rise any faster. In which case, as the government continues its printing spree, and everybody is now trying to unload the dollars instead of hoard them, now the velocity really picks up, and now the pace of the dollar's decline uh, picks up even further. And at some point, as I said, if the global economy starts to improve, which I think it will, then you, know, you have a lot of the world's money is parked in the dollar right now. It's parked there as a safe haven. It's there temporarily because people are nervous. But the minute the situation outside the United States starts to improve, now they, don't, now they want to cash in their insurance policies. They don't want their dollars anymore. They want to bring the money home. They want to do something more productive with it. That's going to be the problem because when everybody tries to sell the dollar and the Fed is still printing them, the dollar is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the U.S. economy makes up, what, about 40% of the global GDP? So wouldn't it be pretty much impossible for the rest of the world to be doing well and not the United States? No, that's not impossible. Because what happens is a lot of our uh, the GDP is consumption. And the world can simply consume more as the United States consumes less. And that will happen if foreign currencies really rise. One of the reasons that global consumption has not gained more during this downturn is because the dollar has gained value. So foreign currencies have gone down in value, and that's undermined the purchasing power of outside the United States. But the minute the dollar's downward trend resumes, then that enhances purchasing power abroad, mm -hmm. and it makes it easier for them to consume. But I just mentioned earlier in the show that this last month, even as U.S. car sales dropped, you have a 25% increase in car sales in China. So the Chinese are buying more, you know, and that's going to continue. Sounds good. Well, Peter, I uh, hope you run for Senate. Uh, you already got my vote. Uh, I think you can do some good there. But well, I, I also think your vote's going to help, right? You're in Illinois. Yeah? Hey, well, I, 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 uh, I was on your website. I, I, uh, I'm an advocate, but I think you can do more in the private sector with uh, with individual investors. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. So far, I actually have no official uh, campaign or any real intention to run, uh, but it's interesting to see people speculating about it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of supporters out there, and uh, you're one of the only guys that makes sense right now. So, uh, hey, thanks for taking my call, and uh, right. thank thanks, you. Thanks, Tony. Well, next up is somebody who could actually vote for me if I were running, uh, James in Connecticut. Mr. Schiff. Hey, James. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Uh, thank you for Good. taking my call, and uh, I definitely would vote for you. Um, uh, fantastic show, and uh, the fact that you do it for, for free every week is, uh, is amazing, so I appreciate it. Uh, my question is uh, about gold. I, I don't know if you're sick about talking about it, but uh, um, a lot of the gold naysayers are, seem to be back out in full effect the uh, last couple weeks, and uh, I know it's kind of a short-term question for you, but uh, anything changing about your opinion of it? or oh, My opinion of gold? Yes. Oh, no. I mean, gold's pulled back a little bit, but still around 